to be dealing with what I call bloody lunacy. Now, see, the thing you have to realize is the word lunacy, is it okay if we have some fun this morning, okay? Um, The word lunacy originates from the Roman goddess Luna. Since ancient times, full moons have been associated with odd or insane behavior, including sleepwalking, suicide, illegal activity, fits of violence, uh, transforming into werewolves, and of course, prophesying the end times. Indeed, the words lunacy and lunatic come from the Roman goddess of the moon, Luna, who is said to ride her silver chariot across the dark sky each night. For thousands of years, doctors and mental health professionals believed in a strong connection between the mania and the moon. Hippocrates, considered the father of modern medicine, wrote in the 5th century BC that one who is seized with terror, fright, or madness during the night is being visited by the goddess of the moon. In 18th century England, people on trial for murder could campaign for a lighter sentence on grounds of lunacy if the crime occurred under a full moon. Meanwhile, psychiatric patients at London's Bethlehem Hospital were shackled and flogged as a preventative measure during lunar phases. Even today, despite studies discrediting the hypothesis, some people think full moons make everyone a little lunity. And in a very real sense, the mass display of Christian ignorance over the four blood moons is demonstrative of a type of lunacy, otherwise intelligent people becoming temporarily insane over the notions of prophetic significance regarding supposed signs in the heavens. Let's talk a little bit more about prophetic things from a past. On the screen, I've got a guy by the name of Edgar C. Wisenant, and he wrote a very famous book called 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Be in 1988. He was a former NASA scientist, and he used poor, contrived, messed up theories based on obscure mathematical formulas. However, far too many Christians sold their homes and quit their jobs, having falling for his charlatanism. Amazingly, after having been proved wrong by events, Wisenout continued to produce books. The first one, published after 88 Reasons, was published in 1989, and it was called The Final Shout, The Rapture Report, or 89 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Occur in 1989. In it, he claimed that the calendar was off by a year, so that means that... uh, His timing wasn't on. He went on to produce several more corrections in the 1990s before finally passing away in 2001. False prophecy. Next, we got a guy by the name of Robert Fade, and he wrote a book called Gorbachev, Has the Real Antichrist Come? Fade was a nuclear engineer. He predicted that Mikhail Gorbachev would emerge as the Antichrist, that the Warsaw Pact would prove to be the 10-nation confederation that supported him. It is altogether possible that Fade misinterpreted the mark of the beast. He just saw that and thought it had to be the Antichrist. (laughs) Today, old Robert has faded from the limelight because he's dead. The Warsaw Pact is no more, and Mikhail Gorbachev travels the world making speeches few people care about. This little blueberry keeps on spinning. Perhaps most recently is a gentleman by the name of Harold Camping. He was a California radio preacher, and he made a name for himself and family radio by claiming the world would end on May 21st, 2011. And then again on October 21st, 2011. Mr. Camping also prophesied the apocalypse would come in 1994, but said later that didn't happen because of a mathematical error. That's good to know. In May 2011, they put up 5,000 of these billboards you see on the screen. They posted them around the U.S. and declared the end was nigh. Many of his followers donated their possessions or gave away their homes to support this PR campaign. And when May 21, nothing happened, they were left with literally nothing. So now he has decided to resign, apologizing for leading his followers astray and admitting that he finds the whole thing rather embarrassing. He was ridiculed when he claimed humanity would be wiped out with a series of earthquakes before uh, months of torment for those left behind. And when his predictions failed on May 21st, he claimed it was only a spiritual judgment and the actual end of the world would be October 21st. Mr. Camping also suffered a stroke after May 21st prediction failed. He then resigned from Family Radio after October 21 failure. He says, we're living in a day when one problem follows another, Mr. Camping said on the following radio website. Why didn't Christ return on October 21st? Listen to his reasonings. He said, it seems embarrassing for family radio, but God was in charge of everything, so it's God's fault. We came to the conclusion after quite careful study of the Bible. He allowed everything to happen the way it did without correction. He could have stopped everything if he wanted to. I want to revamp our sovereignty doctrine. We say that bad things happen not because God's in control of everything that happens. It's because there's an enemy. It's because we live in a fallen world. It's because people make bad choices. And it's because people are stupid. Okay. 
So moving on, this is Pastor John Hagee, and he has written the book Four Blood Moons. Now, that said, he's actually ripping off Pastor Mark Blitz, who wrote Blood Moons and actually discovered this phenomena in 2008. Let's get into a term here. We're going to be using the term tetrad a lot. It comes from two Greek words, uh, tetra, meaning four of something, such as our term tesseract is a four-sided or a, a six-sided cube with four points or four, four squares on all points uh, from Avenger fame. You get the same Greek word there. So what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about the fact that from 15th of April 2014 till the 28th of September 2015, there is going to be a pattern of four blood moons that happen to fall on Jewish feast days. Now, in between them, there is also a complete solar eclipse and, uh, by some calculations, a partial solar eclipse uh, on Rosh Hashanah. So, this past year, April 15th, 2014, Passover had a blood moon. In October, we're going to see another blood moon on the Feast of Tabernacles. Then in 2015, there will be a solar eclipse in March, another blood moon on Passover, and another blood moon on that Feast of Tabernacles. What they're trying to say here is that significant events in the history of Israel are tied to these blood moon tetrads, which are linked to Israel's feast days, okay? And they're trying to predict that something significant is going to happen in the Middle East sometime during this two-year period of time. You with me? And they're trying, they're, they're, these books are everywhere. They're constantly posting it on Facebook. I actually had a lady this past week tell me that I was deceived by the dark one for not believing that this was biblical when I was discussing it on Facebook this past week. We're going to talk a little bit about the ghosts of Blood Moon's past. In both Blitz's and Haggy's book, three prior instances of these Blood Moon tetrads can be identified. One, in 1493 to 1494, Another in 1949 to 1950, and another in 1967 to 1968. The first one were years marked by the tragic expulsion of Jews from the kingdom of Spain, followed by the triumph of discovery of America, where Jews might later find a refuge and an ally to the modern state of Israel. The next, of course, is marked by the founding of the modern Jewish state, Israel's triumph over its aggressive neighbors in their war for independence, and it was a hallmark moment that went from tears to triumph for the nation's survival. The 67 to 68 aligned with the Six-Day War when the uh, Israelites, again, fought off Egypt, Jordan, and uh, Syria in order to take control of their capital city, Jerusalem, and so the premise that's being put forth is when these tetrads happen, something is going to happen somehow in 2014 and 2015 that could signal the beginning of end time events. That's what they're trying to say, okay? And they're trying to tell us that from scripture is what's happening here. So the question we want to ask is, does this mean the 2014-15 tetrad will also see some significant event in Jewish history? There's more than meets the eye here because lunar eclipses can only take place during a full moon. And Jewish feasts are on a lunar calendar. So therefore, in and of itself, it's not very unusual for full moons to take place on Jewish feast days. Their entire calendar is built on the lunar cycles. Okay? That's how the feasts work. They determined the new moon and then they counted from the new moon to the right time to get to their feasts. Passover, Rosh Hashanah, Tabernacle, all of it. So that's not, that's not some great miracle that that's happening. That's how the system was designed. With me? Okay. What you want to realize is that according to astronomer Danny Faulkner, of the 230 lunar eclipses that took place in the 20th century, one-sixth took place on a Jewish holiday. That's a pretty big amount. It's not that unusual. But see, the issue that we're having here with Haggy and with Blitz is they are telling us that history says that God is putting signs in the heavens so that Israel can see these blood moons and know that he is still their God. Haggy makes the claim that the blood moons are a sign specifically to Israel. But because 
in his definition of these tetrads, it's not just the four blood moons, it's also that solar eclipse that falls somewhere in between them. According to Haggy's book, the solar eclipses are assigned to the world at large. So you need four blood moons and one solar eclipse for this to be a pattern of this prophecy, and this is supposed to be telling the world, the entire world, that we are approaching the end times. You with me? That's what he's trying to say. This is one of the largest preachers in America. The true historical perspective says this. The same combination also occurred four extra times from the birth of Christ to the period where supposedly these tetrads were taking place. It didn't just happen in 1492 or 1949 or 1967 or in 2014. No, it also happened in 162 AD to 163 AD, 795 AD, to 796 AD, 842 AD to 843 AD, and 860 to 861 AD. You know why Haggy doesn't put these four tetrads in his book? Because nothing significant happened. No significant events in Jewish history took place during those four tetrads, and that would screw up the whole issue. For the first one, 162 to 163 AD, at the time of this tetrad, history was over 90 years past the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD and 30 years past the final rebellion of the Jews under the leader Bar Kokhba. The period of the rabbis was soon to ensue and Rome was slowly relaxing its restriction on Jews under the leadership of Antonius Pius, who died in 161 AD. But the years of 162 to 163 AD, when the heavens shouted in the same way Haggai supposed that they did later on, witnessed nothing of significance. What about the next one, 795 to 796? This period is more known for the rise of Islam than it is for the history of Judaism. The Jews on this time enjoyed a degree of protection and sponsorship under the Holy Roman Emperor Charlemagne. But the significant years of the Tetride provide us with no great event of significance to the Jews. What about the next one, 842 to 843? The Jews of this period continued to prosper under the reign of Charlemagne's son, Louis the Pious, from 814 to 840 AD. Louis even created a law protecting Jews prior to 825 AD. However, yet again, there was no event of significance to the Jewish people during that tetrad. 860 to 861? These years, too, are silent in terms of significance. So if Haggai is right, in every instance of a tetrad ought to have been marked by some events of significance to Jewish history, and according to him, it had to be an event which turned tears into triumph. That's his theme. What I want to point out to you, though, is if anything, these years were marked by restful snore of people at relative peace, four of the seven tetrads between the birth of Christ and and now provide no evidence for Haggai and Blitz's speculations. What's that mean? That's a failure rate of 57%. Since this isn't alleged to be a work of God, we would not expect to find a failure rate of 57%. But everybody in Christianity goes, ooh, ah, John Haggai said it. Glory to God, God is shining from the heavens. He is using NASA and Google, he says in his books and on his sermons about it, to show us that God is speaking a message to us. Because that's where you look all this stuff up. But as I'll show you in a minute, apparently they didn't. So how significant are the tetrads that were discussed? Let's look at the three previous ones that he discussed and see what he says. This is the tetrad of 1493 to 1494 AD. There is a lunar eclipse on April 2nd, 1493. There is a solar eclipse on September 24th, 1493. The second of the four lunar eclipses is on the next day, September 25th, 1493. And then there is a lunar eclipse on March 22nd, 1494, and on September 15th, 1494. That's how it works. So Hagee's claim is that this tetrad is connected to the expulsion of the Jews by Spain. They were removed from that country. We can safely say that that premise can be rejected. Why? Although the expulsion from Spain was undoubtedly a significant historical event, it only affected a portion of Jews alive at the time, namely between 200,000 and 500,000 according to various estimates. But Jews of this age lived all over Europe. So this event hardly affected the Jews as an entire group of people. More than that, we believe in this church that you can take the word precisely, 
and that God, in prophecies like Daniel's 70 weeks and others, doesn't miss the mark even by a day. Remember when we did that? Okay. So if this is really God, I have a question for you. Because the key event was the royal edict which expelled the Jews from Spain, but this edict was not issued until March 31st, 1492, not 1493. The edict was issued over a year before the first of the four lunar eclipses. Is God off by this much in his signs in the heavens? How were they supposed to figure out that a year later, when there is the beginning of a series of four eclipses, that it all pertains to something that happened a year before that. It doesn't make good sense, but that's not what they tell you in the books. In his teachings, Haggai expands the connection between the Tetrad and the Jewish people by appealing to the voyage of Christopher Columbus. According to Haggai, Columbus himself was of Jewish descent, and his finding of America gave Jews both a place of refuge and a future ally. Now, while the Jewishness of Columbus is a theory that is indeed held by some respective historians, the notion that Columbus discovered America in the sense of the United States is patently untrue. Not one of Columbus's four voyages had him setting foot on the land that is now called the United States of America. He was all in the Caribbean. Not one. In fact, it wasn't until 1565 that the founding of the city of St. Augustine, Florida, that any European is known for certain to have set foot on what is now American soil. So the edict takes place a year before, and obviously Christopher Columbus never set foot on America in that time. Now, as far as America being a refuge for the Jews, the earliest Jew to set foot in what is now the United States was a man by the name of Elias Lagarde, and he did not arrive until 1621 two centuries later. But God was putting signs in the heavens. So did God miss the mark? The first Jewish settlers came to New York. You ready for it? They came to New Amsterdam, which is New York, in case you're not a They Might Be Giants fan. Didn't arrive in the United States until 1654. That's 162 years after this set of tetrads. Does that seem like the precision we're used to God's doing when he does prophecy. Now, I hate to burst Columbus's bubble, but on top of that, he wasn't the first guy to discover America. That honor belongs to a fellow by the name of Leif Erikson, a Viking explorer who arrived somewhere on the North Atlantic coast, actually in the United States, some 300 years before 1492. Though you really ought to stick around when we do our Genesis series because we're going to go a leaf one better and we're going to prove that the Phoenicians, circa 2500 BC to 1500 BC, landed in America because guess what, guys? We have evidence of their mining operations on the Great Lakes. So, the expulsion from the Jews from Spain in the 1490s is far from unique. In 1182 AT, Jews were expelled from France by King Philip Augustus. In 1622 AD, Jews were expelled from Switzerland by Swiss Parliament. How diabolically neutral of them. 1100 to 1500 AD, Jews were expelled by no less than 12 European nations, none of which coincide with a four blood moon and one solar eclipse tetrad, thus turning tears into triumph. Anybody else starting to get the feeling that everybody who bought that book should have had something hit them on the back of the head of the way out of the store? It's just not good. A final consideration is the visibility of each respective eclipse tetrad, and we'll do this with each of them. Lunar eclipses are meant to be signs to the people of Israel. Solar eclipses are meant to be signs to the world at large. Remember that. If this is indeed the case, we would expect each lunar eclipse in the tetrad to be visible to the people of Israel and each solar eclipse to be witnessed all over the world or at the very least to those who were persecuting the Jews. In the case of this tetrad, we'd expect the lunar eclipses to be visible to the Jews who are being persecuted in Spain. After all, that's who God's sending the message to, right? I went on NASA's website. I found the charts for these specific eclipses. Haggy makes a big deal of saying the signs in the heavens were witnessed by NASA and Google. Well, according to NASA's eclipse website, the nation of Spain did not bear witness to at least two of these eclipses. I'm going to show you how these work, okay? If you see the chart, the black dot on each and every one of these, that's the moon. 
Okay, so don't let the darkened portions of the graph show you. The darkened portions of the graph are the portions of the planet that can't see the eclipse. So the further away you go from that black circle, the less chance you have of seeing any of it. For the April 2nd, 1493 eclipse, Spain witnessed a full lunar eclipse there, and Spain would have also seen the full lunar eclipse of uh, the 1494 March eclipse. It would have seen those two. You can see from the charts, because, you know, here's your dot, And here's Spain. They would have seen the full eclipse, okay? But for this one, the eclipse is all the way over here, and Spain is all the way over here. They don't even see it. It's not even visible for the September 25th, 1493. And as for the last one, of course Spain didn't see it because it was all the way over the Americas, and Spain is all the way over here. They couldn't even see these signs in the heavens that God is supposedly showing them that were messages to them. Now, what about the solar eclipse? that's supposed to be a sign to the world. The world is supposed to see it. Well, that solar eclipse conveniently traced an arc across the North Pacific Ocean where there is nobody. Nobody could see it. In fact, if it was Hagee's intention to find an eclipse that absolutely no one is likely to have seen, he was a smashing success. That's the picture. Let's take a look at the next one, Tetrad Pass number six, the 1949 to 1950 Tetrad that took place. You have a lunar eclipse on April 13th, 1949. You have a lunar eclipse on October 7th, 1949, Passover and Tabernacles. You have a lunar eclipse on April 2nd, 1950. You have a solar eclipse on September 12th, 1950. And then you have the final lunar eclipse, September 23rd, 1930. Hagee connects these eclipses to the founding of Israel, which occurred in 1948. He does not mention any significant event that occurred during the span of time associated with these eclipses. So again, the final day of Israel's war for independence was March 10th, 1949, one month before the first lunar eclipse of the Tetrad. They declared independence in 1948. So again, God is missing the mark. Haggai has been telling us that God himself ordained these eclipses as signals. Assuredly, if this was God's intention, he would have been able to achieve a precise match and not miss the events in question by even the slimmest margin. He doesn't miss Christ's entry into Jerusalem by even a day. So let's take a look at the chart here for 1949 to 1950. How visible were these eclipses? Well, starting with the lunar ones, which by the reckoning should have been a sight for sore eyes over the nation of Israel itself. Of the four lunar eclipses, three were seen not as full, but as partial eclipses in Israel. We're all the way out here. The eclipse is here, and it's all the way out there. It's partial eclipse. You've got to be in this ring for a full eclipse. Nope, Israel's all the way over here. Again, we're going to see that one is one full eclipse. Only one, the April 2nd, 1950, could be seen as a total eclipse, and because his thinking is it had to be four complete signs on Jewish holidays, one out of four doesn't count. But what about the solar eclipse? It was supposed to be a sign to the world, this time a sign to the world to say, yes, I have given Israel back this country. This one was a little bit better, because there at least might have been some Yupik Eskimos that saw this solar eclipse as it headed past Alaska. In 1949, I highly doubt they had cell phones to call the Arab nations around Israel and said, hey, God just put a sign in the heavens. We wanted to let you know we're going to go back to eating whale blubber. You with me? Sign to the nations at large. Tetrad Pass number seven, 1967 and 1968. You have a lunar eclipse on April 24th, 1967. You have a lunar eclipse on October 18th, 1967 a solar eclipse on November 2nd, 1967, the third lunar eclipse on April 13th, 1968, and the fourth on October 6th, 1968. Hagee connects these eclipses to the great six-day war in which the state of Israel met three of its Arab opponents, Egypt, Syria, and Jordan, in battle. True to its name, this war was fought between June 5th and June 10th, 1967, and was a stunning victory for Israel against all odds. A man by the name of Stephen Preston just wrote a book called The Lion's Gate, detailing the work of many of these young soldiers in their lives. I highly suggest you get it. I highly suggest you read it. It's, it's, a, it's a good read. It takes two years, according to Hagee, 
to give a sign for a war that lasted six days. Because everybody's going to think to sync those babies up. But it is arguably a success against all odds for Hagee. There are two considerations we do have to weigh in. Here we have the Six-Day War taking place between April and October 67, so this one at least falls within the scope of the Tetrads. First, not one of the eclipses actually took place during the war itself. Second, There have been far too many events in Jewish history, including many that affect large numbers of the Jewish people that were not accompanied by a tetrad for Haggai's thesis to make sense. I don't know, for instance, the Holocaust. If any event can be called significant in the hallmarks of Jewish history, it's the Holocaust where six million Jews were brutally and wantonly murdered by the infamous Nazi regime. Yet not one year in that tragic period between 1933 and 1945 saw a blood moon tetrad. Not one. Seemed like a significant event. Maybe, I don't know, God was asleep. Just took, took that decade off. What about the pogroms that took place in the Russia? Pogrom means violent attacks that were conducted on Jews in Russia in the 19th century. These attacks caused worldwide outrage, but the heavens, according to Hagee, and God through the heavens, well, they were strangely silent. Not a word. What about the uh, destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD? Jesus himself steps into the prophetic shoes and prophesies this event taking place. He says it's going to happen. And according to Josephus, the Jewish historian, the destruction of the Jewish temple in 70 AD was marked by certain heavenly signs, but not a tetrad. The final destruction of Jewish resistance in 135 AD in response to the Bar Kokhba rebellion also passed the heavens unobserved. No markings. So let's take a look at what was seen, the visibility of the 1967 to 68 tetrad. Once again, we'd expect Israel to be the main intended audience for these four blood moons, specifically the lunar ones. Three of the four lunar eclipses, not one of them were visible in Israel as a total eclipse only the eclipse on April 13th, 1968 was visible as a partial eclipse. What about the uh, solar eclipse that was supposed to be assigned to the entire world? Hey guys, I gave Israel back Jerusalem. As for the solar eclipse of 1967, it's another major miss for Haggai. Unlike the last two, this one didn't even have the courtesy to appear over any land to speak of because its path made a half moon of frigid ocean just north of the Antarctic continent. Sign to the world. They failed to mention all of this stuff. They're making millions off of New York Times best-selling books saying that this is a prophetic event of the end times. And most people couldn't even see them when they took place. Guys, I know you think a lot of me, but I'm not a rocket scientist. All I did was go on the website that they said I could go to and check out what they're publishing their book about, and they're wrong. Does that make sense? So what about this tetrad, this monumental moment that we're living in, 2014 to 2015? Well, it's too early as of this presentation to say if any significant event will happen to meet Haggy's qualifications, but given how crazy things are in the Middle East, One doesn't have to be a rocket scientist to say it's unwise to bet against it. But if you want to discuss the visibility factor, Haggy still comes up less than impressive. This is our tetrad while we're alive. April 15th of this year, again, we have three that aren't even seen as a partial eclipse from Israel. And one that is. Is this prophecy? Is this rightly dividing the word of God? The solar eclipse that's going to take place, it gets a little better for Blitz and Haggy this time around. On March 20th, 2015, the solar eclipse path is the broadest of the four to which Haggy appeals. Even so, it takes it over a remote part of the North Atlantic and Arctic Oceans with only the Faroe Islands and an island of Svarlbad along the way. Fewer than 50,000 people inhabit these remote islands. 
which are difficult to reach and are frequently subject to cloud cover, especially in March when the Arctic winter is still blowing its way through. So chances are nobody's going to see that solar eclipse either. So claims based on visibility and occurrence of the total eclipses can be outright rejected because it just doesn't make sense to anybody who puts the time in. Haggy's claims can be rejected on the grounds of relevance because they just don't seem to tie into anything. They can be rejected on the grounds of accuracy because they're so far from accurate, it's laughable. And they can be rejected on the grounds of legitimacy because they can't stand. Scientifically speaking, this is not at all the case. They say that this time the whole world's going to be able to see it because we have the technology to broadcast it over the internet. So the argument is God's putting signs in the heavens, but he does so three times before we have the technology to do it and people just miss it. Yet this is the same God who's able to put the star of Bethlehem in the sky to lead the Magi to find a baby in a town in Bethlehem before we even had radio. Haggai and Blitz appeal to that as a sign that God uses signs in the heaven. Genesis 1.14 says that the signs, the stars, the moons, they were put in place as signs. But this is not the right application of that. It's a misapplication of Scripture. So does Scripture tell us to look for divine billboards, as Haggai says, in this way? Is it biblically sound to look for signs in the tetrads based on the Scriptures? Well, like we said, the star of Bethlehem They appeal to this, and it doesn't matter whether the star was a comet, a planetary conjunction, a manifestation of the Shekinah, or something else altogether. It did signify to the Magi in Matthew chapter 2 where Jesus was born. But you have to remember that the star of Bethlehem is reported in Matthew's gospel as part of a historical narrative. This is fact. This happened. The problem with Hagee and Blitz and others, Perry Stone, that are all jumping on this bandwagon, is the text that they are using to define this as biblical isn't a historical narrative, it's a prophetic text out of Joel 2, 31. And that text says, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. This passage is also mirrored several times in the New Testament. According to Haggai, this is sufficient to suppose that God uses eclipses as divine billboards. Neither Joel 2.31 or the New Testament passages that echo it call for multiple eclipses. You read the text, so did I. It says one solar eclipse, one blood moon. There's nothing in the text, in the Hebrew, in the Greek, in the English, I don't care if you're reading your Bible in Swahili, that says there's four eclipses. You with me? You can't draw that from the text. Also, notice how Haggai related all of these tetrads to significant events in Jewish history. What does the text say? The text says that this is going to happen as a precursor to the coming day of judgment of the Lord. That's not Greek for significant events in Jewish history. That's talking about one day, the day, the Lord's day, not the Jews getting expelled from Spain, not the independence of Israel, not the recapturing of Jerusalem, and not me going back to Jerusalem in 2014. It's just not. That is a significant event, by the way. They're blessed to have me. Russia, February 2013. Recent history. You see, Haggai is also way too eager to understand stellar events as divine billboards. In February 2013, a meteor soared over Russia and caused a shockwave that injured a lot of people, though no one died, and did a lot of property damage, mostly in the form of broken windows. Haggy says in his book and in his sermon series that this was a sign from heaven and a supernatural FedEx message to the people of Russia. He supposes it was a message to Russia as an atheistic nation that God is unique and can do whatever he pleases, but what about this specifically related such a message? For all we know, God was trying to tell Russia, you need to build stronger windows. If this was a sign from the heavens to tell an atheistic Russia that God is supreme, then what about the events that took place in Tunguska, Russia in 1908? You see, in 1908, there was a stellar object technically not a meteorite, it was actually called a bolide, 
That was the biggest hit we've had from a stellar object since humans have been recording history. It hit in a remote, swampy area of Russia, and the impact it made would have made the comet of 2013 look like someone fired a pop gun. You can see the crater of it on the screen. But in 1908, Russia wasn't an atheistic country as it was still under the czars, and Christianity under the Russian Orthodox Church was still very prominent. So by Hagee's logic, God sent a bigger, nastier message to a still semi-Christian nation than he did to the atheistic pagan nation of Russia today. Why is it important that we be rational when we decide something is prophetic? The biggest difference between a guy that you can obviously look at and say that guy is out of his gourd and John Hagee is Hagee is preaching in front of a crowd of probably 10,000 people. That's not what it's about. It doesn't matter how strong your voice, it doesn't matter how impactful you speak, it doesn't matter how many times you pronounce God as a two-syllable word, that doesn't mean you're authoritative. Before we wrap up, though, let's look at Hagee's past prophetic failures. Four Blood Moons is only the most recent attempt by John Hagee to tie current events to what he argues will be the imminent occurrence of end-time events. In fact, he has an extensive record of error when it comes to tying current events to what he supposes will be the end of days. Each time he has done so, he has not only failed, but he has also failed to make up for his own mistakes. For instance, in 1996, he published a book called The Beginning of the End, and its prophetic claims were the assassination of Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin launched Bible prophecy onto the fast track. He said... Blood will now become the bonding force that will drive the nation of Israel and other leaders of the Middle East to new heights of unity to secure a legacy of peace in Rabin's memory. Hagee also indicated that the Ebola virus was a signal of the imminent end, and oil would be the main motive for Russian invasion of Israel as they would attack Israel to appease Islamic nations and pay Russia with oil in return for the favor. Almost 20 years ago. Let's see how it worked out. Well, Rabin's tragic death did not lead to a legacy of peace even 20 years later because Hamas was bombing uh, or shooting rockets into Israel, I don't know, yesterday. You with me? The Ebola virus does remain a threat, but major outbreaks have killed less than 1,000 people in Africa since 1996. Doesn't sound like the end times to me. And Russia has yet to attack Israel to get oil or for any other reason. What about this one? In 1999, he wrote a book called From Daniel Till Doomsday. And in its prophetic claims, yes, that's right, my friend, he says the Y2K bug will lead to economic collapse and imminent chaos and death. Let's wait for just a minute, though. Did this book apologize for the error in prophetic predictions three years prior? And from Daniel till doomsday, the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin is no longer seen as a sign of anything. But in addition to the Y2K bug, he also says that Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein would join forces with Russia to invade Israel. Let's see how that worked out. So this time, Yitzhak Rabin no longer means nothing. And the Y2K bug is going to devastate humanity. And of course, Y2K didn't do anything. Saddam Hussein, evil dictator that he was, was found in a hole in the ground. And uh, he's now dead, so unless he plans to join with Russia and start the zombie apocalypse, we're not going to see anything happen. Oh yeah, and uh, Russia has yet to attack Israel to get oil or for any other reason. Battle for Jerusalem, Dateline 2000, prophetic claims. Oh yeah, no apologies for the Y2K failure whatsoever. And some pages are exact copies of From Daniel Till Doomsday. Verbatim. 2008, Financial Armageddon. Prophetic claims. In light of the financial crisis of the day, it is argued people will look for a global leader to solve financial problems, and that global leader will be none other than the Antichrist. Many believe we are still experiencing the results of that economic crash, but six years later, we still see no serious effort to unify the world under one leader as a way to solve anyone's or any nation's financial problems. 
At least three times, Hege has chosen different current events as a signal for the imminent end in the age of catastrophes, as each time he has been proven wrong and he has not apologized. James 3.1 tells us, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. Hagee can pound on his podium and get righteously indignant and flap his gums and say all of these things are signs from Israel. He's a teacher that fails to meet James's strict, stringent standard as a teacher. Given his poor record, we can only claim that at a minimum, Hagee is a prophetic and utter failure. But why would we even want to listen to his teachings on anything else when he treats the Bible so callously? Go home this week and listen to something he's preaching. Listen to his voice. Listen to how he comes across as authoritative. He reminds me of someone who gets really upset, just can't even control himself and say, why? Why, of course this is God. (laughs) And that's when it hit me. He did a cameo on Star Wars Episode (laughs) 1. Glory to God. So from now on, we're going to call him John Hubba Bubba Heggie. So what about Mark Blitz? Arguably, Haggie doesn't even deserve the top billing because Blitz is the one who Haggie has claimed as his inspiration, though oddly, Blitz doesn't mention Haggie in any of his books. Blitz is the pastor of El Shaddai Ministries in Bonnie Lake, Washington. His ministry has a special focus on the Jewish roots of Christianity. His book, though, spends more time giving his personal testimony and discussing Jewish feasts and their meaning than it does justifying any special import of the blood moon cycle. How many know we know there is prophetic symbolism within the Jewish feasts? That's within scripture. We nailed that one home in our series. If you want to listen to it, we'll get it into your hands. Okay? That is beyond a shadow of a doubt but that doesn't mean it ties into these blood moons. Unlike Hagee, Blitz does admit that the 2014-15 eclipses won't be visible over the areas of alleged historic significance, like um, Israel. Also unlike Hagee, he includes a partial eclipse on the Feast of Trumpets as part of his formula, not that this is any more helpful. It will appear only over southern portions of Africa and Antarctica. I really love how God has launched full world-class heavenly missions to Antarctica. That is cool. He also presents some rather obscure mathematics to show that 49 prophetic years after Jerusalem was captured by the Jews in 1967, we come to the holiday of Yom Kippur in September 2015, for whatever good that does. Blitz is somewhat vague over what he thinks the Tetrad will signify. He says possible war in the Middle East and global economic collapse. Solar eclipses around the destruction in 70 A.D., Blitz does at least try to give the connection between eclipses and Jewish history a more solid basis. He says, and I quote, two solar eclipses happened right in a row at the time of the destruction of the temple in 70 AD and on feast days. He said around eight months before the temple was destroyed, we find 101869, there was a partial lunar eclipse on the feast of Sukkot. A total lunar eclipse followed this on 33070 uh, on the first day of Nisan, Two weeks later, there was a penumbral lunar eclipse on Passover 4, 1470 and an annual solar eclipse followed by this on Rosh Hashanah 92370. Then another penumbral eclipse on uh, Sukkot 10, 1870. But remember, there is nothing odd about eclipses falling on feast days. It's designed to happen that way. He also makes it sound like these eclipses were visible in Israel. Some were, but not all. There is also one on September 9th of 70 AD that Blitz fails to mention. This is more than likely because it disrupts the flavor of these being special series of eclipses that happen on holidays. Because if you have one that didn't, well, what do you do with it? Now, his attempt to address the problem of eclipses not being seen over Israel in general is this, and I'm quoting him for a reason. Listen to what he says. Listen to his attitude. He said, other grumblers protest that not all the four eclipses in the coming tetrad will be seen in Jerusalem. So what? They weren't all seen in Israel when that tiny country became a Jewish nation in 1948, and they weren't all seen in Jerusalem when the Jews recaptured it in 67. Still, everyone would agree that these were extremely significant prophetic events. So what? Maybe they were. But that doesn't mean these eclipses had anything to do with them. And if you didn't see them, well, sorry, guess you missed it. God will do what he wants to, whether we like it or not, know it or not, see it or not, or even care. 
This is a very narrow view of prophecy anyway. God loves the whole world, not just the Jewish people. And that the eclipses will not be all visible in Jerusalem is a moot point because with the advent of technology, everyone in Jerusalem, or for that matter, anyone with an internet connection anywhere in the world will be able to see every one of these eclipses. Even without technology, every part of the world will see at least one of them. God is announcing his signals to all tribes, tongues, and nations. I said this is what it is, and I have a lot of money riding on this book, so God must be behind me. Do you see the attitude? So what? Deuteronomy 18.22 says, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. Lines like, so what? God will do what he wants, and sorry if you missed it, hardly seem to answer the objections. We are also having to remain wondering how God is announcing anything to any tribes, tongues, nations with eclipses that occur over ocean or frozen, uninhabited ice shelves in tundra. Blitz's response to the objections of the blood moons not lining up with the historical events they are supposed to signify, and this is what we'll close with. This is also totally missing the point, he says. Think of it this way. America or the United Nations may think they should get the credit or the blame, depending on how you look at it, for the creating Israel in 1948. But the fact that these four blood moons occurred in 1949 and 1950 is, I believe, God's way of telling the world it was his doing and had nothing to do with the United Nations. I think, I feel, my opinion is. They were mere puppets in the hand of God in 1967 when the first of the four blood moons occurred a few months before the Six-Day War. God was telling the nation of Israel that his hands were going to be all over it. Sadly, these signals were totally missed by everyone anyway. So the connections were not made until I discovered them in 2008. At least this time, we have a forewarning of what may come. His answer is merely a presumed interpretation of what God is trying to say after he already assumes that God is saying anything. So in essence, he is saying that for centuries, God has sent out these messages by way of eclipses that absolutely no one understood until, thank God for him, a mere six years ago, he uncovered this message. Guys, the reason that I took us off course this week and put us in a place where there had to be a prophetic understanding is yes, a third of the Bible is prophetic in nature. And yes, there are a whole lot of views about eschatology in the end times that are not necessarily what we believe. But as disciples, we have a responsibility to at least understand them so that we can rebuff them. The next, whatever it is, blood moons, Jesus showing up in a freshly opened tub of peanut butter, Whatever it may be, you guys need to not jump on that bandwagon. You need to calmly take it to the word, see if it is so, and make sure that these speakers back up what they're saying. If you are a person who bought the four blood moons, you should go to your local Barnes & Noble and ask for a refund. Because this is not prophecy. This is is charlatanism, hucksterism, designed to make a buck. Okay?